Chapter forty eight, part one of the Mysteries of London. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dave Wills. The Mysteries of London by George Reynolds. Chapter forty eight, part one. Mr. Greenwood's Visitors. Mr. Greenwood was seated in his study the morning after the event which occupied the last chapter. He was dressed en negligé. A French velvet skull-cap, embroidered with gold, sat upon his curled and perfumed hair. A sumptuous brocade silk dressing-gown was confined around the waist by a gold cord with large tassels hanging almost to his feet. His shirt-collar was turned down over a plain broad black ribbon, the bow of which was fastened with a diamond brooch of immense value and on his fingers were costly rings, sparkling with the tones of corresponding kind and worth. On the writing-table an elegant French watch, attached to a long gold chain, lay amidst a pile of letters, just as if it had been carelessly tossed there. A cheque, partly filled out for a thousand guineas, several banknotes and some loose gold were lying on an open writing-desk, and at one end of the table in seeming confusion a number of visiting cards bearing the names of eminent capitalists wealthy merchants peers and members of parliament all this pell-mell assemblage of proofs of wealth and tokens of high acquaintance was only apparent and not real it was a portion of mr greenwood's system one of the principles of the art which he practised in deceiving the world he knew none of the capitalists and few of the aristocrats whose cards lay upon his table, and his own hand had arranged the manner in which the watch, the cheque-book, and the money were tossing about. Never did a coquette practice a particular glance, attitude, or mannerism more seriously than did Mr. Greenwood. These little artifices, which, however trifling they may appear, produced an immense effect upon those with whom he had to deal, and who visited him in that study. Everything he did was the result of a calculation, and had a name. Every word he spoke, however rapid the utterance, was duly weighed and measured. And yet, at this time, the man who thus carried his knowledge of human nature, even to the most ridiculous niceties, was only in his twenty-eighth year. How perverted were great talents! How misapplied so extraordinary quickness of apprehension in this instance! Mr. Greenwood contemplated the arrangements of his writing-table with calm satisfaction, and a smile of triumph curled his lip as he thought of the position to which such little artifices as those had helped to raise him. He despised the world, he laughed at society, and he cared not for the law. He walked boldly up to the extreme verge, where personal security ceased and peril began, but he never overstepped the boundary. He had plundered many, he had enriched himself with the wealth of others. He had built his own fortunes upon the ruins of his fellow men's hopes and prospects. But still he had so contrived all his schemes that the law could never reach him, and if one of his victims accused him of villainy, he had a plausible explanation to offer for his conduct. If a person said to him, Your schemes have involved me in utter ruin and deprive me of every penny I possessed, he would unblushingly reply, what does the man mean? He forgets that I suffered far more than he did, and that where he lost hundreds, I lost thousands. It is impossible to control speculations. Some turn up well, some badly, and this man might as well blame the keeper of a lottery office because his ticket did not turn up a prize, as attempt to throw any odium upon me. And this language would prove satisfactory and seem straightforward to all bystanders, save the poor victim himself, who nevertheless would be struck dumb by the other's assurance. Greenwood had commenced his ways of intrigue and pursuits of duplicity in the city, where he was known as George Montague. The moment he had obtained a considerable fortune, he repaired to the West End, added the name of Greenwood to his other appellations, and thus commenced, as it were, a new existence in a new sphere. He possessed the great advantages of exercising a complete control over all his feelings, passions, and inclinations, save 
with respect to women. In this point of view he was completely sensualist, a heartless voluptuary. He would spare neither expense nor trouble to gratify his amorous desires, where he formed a predilection, and if, in any case, he would run a risk of involving himself in the complexities of civil or criminal law, the peril would be encountered in an attempt to satisfy his lustful cravings. There are many men of this stamp in the world, especially in great cities, and more especially in London. Mr. Greenwood, having completed the arrangements of his study in the manner described, rang the bell. His French valet, Le Fleur, made his appearance in answer to the summons. Mr. Greenwood then threw himself negligently into the armchair at his writing-table and proceeded to issue his instructions to his dependent. Le Fleur, the Count Altaroni will call this morning. When he has been here about ten minutes, bring me in this letter. He handed his valet a letter, sealed and addressed to himself. At about twelve o'clock, Lord Tremorden will call. Let him remain quietly for a quarter of an hour with me, and then come in and say, The Duke of Portsmouth has sent round, sir, to know whether he can positively rely upon your company to dine this evening. Do you understand? Perfectly, sir, answered Le Fleur, without the slightest variation of countenance for he was too politic and too finished a valet to attempt to criticise his master's proceedings by means of even a look. "'So far, so good,' resumed Mr. Greenwood. "'Sir Rupert Harborough will call this morning, and you will tell him that I am not at home.' "'Yes, sir.' "'Lady Cecilia Harborough will call at one precisely. You will conduct her to the drawing-room.' "'Yes, sir.' "'And all the time she is here, I shall not be at home to a soul.' "'No, sir.' At four o'clock I shall go out in the cab. You can then pay a visit to Upper Clapton, and ascertain, by any indirect means you can light upon, whether Miss Sidney still inhabits the villa, and whether she still pursues the same retired and secluded mode of existence as when you last made inquiries in that quarter. Yes, sir. And you can ride round by Holloway and find out, also by indirect inquiries, remember, whether Mr. Markham is at home and any other particulars relative to him which you can glean. I have already told you that I have the deepest interest in being acquainted with all that young man does, his minutest actions even. I will attend to your order, sir. Tonight you will dress yourself in mean attire and repair to a low public house on Saffron Hill, known by the name of the Boozing Ken by the thieves and reprobates of that district. You will inquire for a man who frequents that house, and who is called Tom the Cracksman. No one knows him by any other name. You will tell him who your master is, and that I wish to see him upon very particular business. He must be here to-morrow night at nine o'clock. Give him this five-pound note as an earnest of good intentions. And now, take these duplicates and that bank-note for five hundred pounds, and just go yourself to the pawnbroker's in the Strand and redeem the diamonds mentioned in these tickets. You will have time before any one comes. Yes, sir. And should Lord Tremorden happen to be here when you return, hand me the packet, which you will have wrapped up in white paper, saying, With the Duke's compliments, sir. Yes, sir. Thus ended the morning's instructions. The valet took the letter which Mr. Greenwood had written to himself, the duplicates and the banknotes, and retired. In half an hour he returned with a small purple Morocco case containing a complete set of diamonds, worth at least twelve hundred guineas. He again withdrew and returned in a few minutes, but this time it was to usher in Count Alteroni. Mr. Greenwood received the Italian noble with more than usual affability and apparent friendship. "'I am delighted to inform you, my dear Count,' he said, when they were both seated that our enterprise is progressing well. I yesterday received a letter from a certain capitalist to whom I applied relative to the loan of two hundred thousand pounds, which I informed you it was necessary to raise to carry out our undertaking, in addition to the capital which you and I have both subscribed, and I have no doubt that I shall succeed in this point. Indeed, he is to send me his decision this very morning. "'Then I hope that at length the company is definitively formed,' said the Count. "'Definitely,' answered Mr. Greenwood. "'And the deed 
by which you guarantee to me the safety of the money I have embarked, let the event be what it may, said the Count. That will be ready tomorrow evening. Can you dine with me tomorrow and, and terminate that portion of the business after dinner? My solicitor will send the deed hither by one of his clerks at half-past eight o'clock. With a pleasure, said the Count, evidently pleased at this arrangement. There has been some delay, said Mr. Greenwood, but really the fault has not existed with me. You will excuse my anxiety in this respect. Indeed, I have probably pressed you more than I ought for the completion of that security. But uh, you will remember that I have embarked my all in this enterprise. Do not attempt an apology. You have acted as a man of prudence and caution. You will find that I shall behave as a man of business. I am perfectly satisfied, said the Count. I should not have advanced my money unless I had been so perfectly satisfied with your representations. For, unless events turn up in my favour in my own country, I must have ever expect to remain an exile from Castelcicala, and that good fortune will shine upon me from that quarter I can scarcely expect. My liberal principles have offended the Grand Duke and the old nobility of that estate. And now that the aristocracy there has again the ascendancy and is likely to retain it, I can hope for nothing. I would gladly have aided the popular cause and obtained for the people of Castelcicala a constitution, but the idea of representative principles is odious to those now in power. I believe that you were a staunch adherent of the Prince of Castelcicala, who was the nephew of the reigning Grand Duke and the heir apparent to the throne, said Mr. Greenwood. You have been rightly informed, but if the Pope and the kings of Naples and Sardinia support the aristocracy of Castelcicala, that a prince will be excluded from his inheritance, and a foreigner will be placed upon the Grand Ducal throne. In this case, the prince will be an exile until his death without even a pension to support him, so irritated are the old aristocracy against him. I believe that Castelcicala is a fine state, a beautiful country, extensive, well cultivated and productive. It contains two million of inhabitants. The capital of Montoni is a magnificent city of a hundred thousand souls. The revenues of the Grand Duke are two hundred thousand pounds sterling a year, and yet he is not contented. He does not study his people's happiness. And where at the present moment is that gallant prince who has thus risked his accession to the throne for the welfare of his fellow countrymen? inquired Greenwood. That remains a secret, answered the Count. His partisans alone know. Of course I would not attempt to intrude upon matters so sacred said Greenwood, were I not deeply interested in yourself, whom I know to be one of his most staunch adherents. At that moment the door opened, and the fleur entered, bearing a letter which he handed to Mr. Greenwood. He then retired. Will you excuse me? said Greenwood to the Count. Then, opening the letter, he appeared to read it with attention. At the expiration of a few moments he said, This letter is from my capitalist. He gives me both good and bad news. He would advance the loan, but he cannot command the necessary amount for three months. Then there will be three months more delay, exclaimed the Count, in a tone of vexation. Three months? <laughs> and what is that? A mere nothing, cried Mr. Greenwood. You can satisfy yourself to my friend's sincerity. With these words he handed to the Count the letter which he had written to himself in a feigned hand, and to which he had affixed a fictitious name and address. The Count read the letter and was satisfied. He then rose to depart. Tomorrow evening, at the seven o'clock upon Tuali, I shall do myself the pleasure of awaiting upon you. In a few days, you remember, I and my family are coming up to town to pass some time with Lord Tremorlin, and I shall then be bold and presumptuous enough said Greenwood, to endeavour to render myself acceptable to the Signora Isabella. By the by, exclaimed the Count, I forgot to inform you of the villainy of that Richard Markham, whom I received into the bosom of my family, and treated as a son or a brother. His villainy? 
ejaculated Greenwood in a tone of unfeigned surprise. Villainy, the most atrocious, cried the Count. He is a man branded with the infamy of a feathens jail. Impossible, said Greenwood, this time affecting the astonishment expressed by his countenance. It is, alas, too true. The night before last, he invited thieves to break into my dwelling, and to those miscreants, and he boasted of his intentions to win the favour of my daughter. Oh, no, no, said Mr. Greenwood emphatically. You must be misinformed. On the contrary, I have received evidence only too corroborative of what I tell you. But when I come tomorrow evening, I will give you the detail. The Count then took his departure. Thank God, said Mr. Greenwood to himself, the moment the door had closed behind the Italian nobleman. I have succeeded in pulling off that bothering Count for three good months. Much may be done in the meantime, and if I can secure his daughter, all will be well. I can then pension him off upon a hundred and fifty pounds a year, and retain possession of his capital. But this deed he demands, the deed of guarantee, he presses for that. I must give him the security to show my good will, and then neutralize that concession on my part in the manner already resolved upon. How strange was the account he gave me of Richard Markham! That unhappy young man appears to be a victim of the most wonderful combination of suspicious circumstances ever known, for guilty he could not be. Oh, no, impossible! Mr. Greenwood's meditations were interrupted by the entrance of Lord Tremordin. This nobleman was a short, stout, good-tempered man. Being a large landholder, he exercised considerable influence in his county, of which he was the Lord Lieutenant, and he boasted that he could return six members to Parliament in spite of the Reform Bill. His wife was, moreover, allied to one of the richest and most important families in the hierarchy of aristocracy and thus Lord Tremordin, with no talent, no knowledge, no acquirements to recommend him, but with certain political tenets which he inherited along with the family estate, and which he possessed for no other reason than because they were those of his ancestors. Lord Tremordin, we say, was a very great man in the House of Lords. He seldom spoke, it is true, but then he voted, and dictated to others how to vote, and in this existed his power. When he did speak, he uttered an awful amount of nonsense. But the reporters were very kind, and so his speeches read well. Indeed, he did not know them again when he perused them in print in the morning after their delivery. Moreover, his wife was a blue stocking, and dabbled a little in politics, and she occasionally furnished her noble husband with a few hints which might have been valuable had he clothed them in language a little intelligible. For the rest, Lord Tremodin was a most hospitable man, was fond of his bottle, and fancied himself a sporting character, because he kept hounds and horses, and generally employed an agent to make up a book for him at races, whereby he was most amazingly plundered. "'My dear Lord!' exclaimed Mr. Greenwood, conducting his noble visitor to a seat. "'I am delighted to see your Lordship look so well.' So you have parted with electricity. I heard of it yesterday at Tattershall's. Yes, and a good price I had for him. By the way, my dear Greenwood, I must not forget to thank you for the hock you sent me. It is superb. I am delighted that your lordship is pleased with it. Have you seen Sir Rupert Harborough lately? My scapegoat son-in-law. I wish I had never seen him at all ejaculated his lordship. He has ever head and ears in debt again, and I swear most solemnly that I will do nothing more for him, not to the amount of a penny piece. Cecilia, too, has quarrelled with her mother, and even if she had not, Lady Tremordin is the last woman on earth to advance them a shilling. It is a pity, a great pity, said Mr. Greenwood, apparently musing. Then, after a brief pause, he added, you never can guess, my dear lord, why I wish to see your lordship so particularly this morning. About the match between electricity and galvanism? The odds are three to four. That was not exactly my business, said Mr. Greenwood with a bland smile. The fact is, the representation of Rottenborough will be vacant in a few weeks. I know positively that the present member intends to accept the children hundreds. 
"'I have received a similar invitation,' observed his lordship. "'At present the matter is a profound secret. "'Yes, a profound secret, known only to the member's friends, "'and me and my friends, and you and your friends,' added the nobleman, "'seriously meaning what he said, without any attempt at irony or satire. "'Of course there will be an election in February, shortly after the Houses meet,' continued Greenwood. I, "'I was going to observe to your lordship that I should be most happy to offer myself as a candidate.' "'You, Greenwood? What? Are you a politician? Not so profound or so well-versed as your lordship, but I flatter myself that, aided by your lordship's advice, Lady Tremordin would never consent to it, and by Lady Tremordin's suggestions it would never do. She will have a mark of rank and family, and excuse me, Greenwood, although you are no doubt rich enough for a lord, and well-educated and clever, and so on, the juice of it is that we don't know who the devil you are. An excellent family, an excellent family, my dear lord, exclaimed Mr. Greenwood, uh, and, and although nothing equal to your own, which I know to be the most ancient in England, or Scotland, or Ireland either, or Scotland, or Ireland, or even Europe, still, no, it cannot be done, Greenwood, it cannot be done, interrupted the nobleman. I would do anything to oblige you, but at that moment the door opened, and the fleur entered the study. "'If you please, sir,' said the French valet, "'the Duke of Portsmouth has sent round to know whether he can positively rely upon your company to dinner this evening.' "'My best compliments to his grace, La Fleur,' said Mr. Greenwood, affecting to meditate upon this message for a moment. "'And I will do myself the honour of waiting on his grace at the usual hour.' "'Very good, sir,' and La Fleur retired. "'Well, after all,' resumed Lord Tremordin, who had not lost a word of this message and the answer, "'I think I might undertake to arrange the Rottenborough business for you. You have high acquaintances, and they often do more good than high connections. So we will consider that matter settled.' "'I'm deeply obliged to your lordship,' said Greenwood, with the calmness of a man who has never entertained a fear of being ultimately unable to carry his point. You will see that I shall imitate in the lower house your lordship's admirable conduct in the upper, to the very best of my ability. Of course, you will always support the measures I support, and oppose those which I may oppose. Oh, that is a matter of course. What will become of society? Where should we be if the commons did not obey the great landholders who allow them to be returned? Ah, what indeed, said the nobleman, shaking his head ominously. "'But really, Greenwood, I wasn't at all aware that you were half so clever a politician as I see you are. "'Your lordship does me honour. I know how to value your lordship's good opinion,' said Greenwood, in a meek and submissive manner. Then, after a moment's silence, he added, "'By the by, I understand that our mutual friend Alteroni and his amiable wife and beautiful daughter are going to pass the first few weeks of the new year with your lordship and lady tremordin yes we shall be very gay the signora must pick up a husband amongst the young nobles or scions of great families whom she will meet this winter in london do you not know my lord said greenwood sinking his voice to a mysterious whisper that count alteroni detests gaiety are you not aware that he and the ladies have accepted your kind invitation under the impression that they will enjoy the pleasing society of your lordship and lady tremordin and a few select friends only i am glad you have told me that exclaimed the nobleman we will have no gaiety at all the count has honoured me with his utmost confidence and his sincere friendship said greenwood oh of course you would be welcome on all occasions do not wait for invitations I, I give you a general one i am more than ever indebted to your lordship after a little more conversation in the same strain the nobleman took his leave more pleased with mr greenwood than ever this gentleman the moment he was alone threw himself into his chair and smiled complacently gained all my points he said musing i, I shall be a member of parliament the fair Isabella will stand no chance of captivating some wealthy, entitled individual who might woo and win her, and I have obtained a general invitation to Lord Tremordin's dwelling. I alone shall therefore have an opportunity of paying court to this Italian beauty. 
End of chapter 48, part 1. Recorded by Dave Wills.